I really do think that consumers need to be protected. They need recourse if they feel that they've been missold something. They need to have confidence in a scheme that is complicated, but somebody else has checked it out for them so they can have confidence in it. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Feddersen, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora. And I'm really excited about the discussion today. I'll be speaking with the CEO and founder of one of the UK's publicly listed energy supply companies. Uh, She's a real clean energy trailblazer, having led the way in delivering clean energy to British customers for over two decades. She's a physicist by training uh, and really exciting. She's one of the first guests I've ever had on the show who owned their own microphone. So the quality (laughs) should be extremely high today. Uh, My guest on the show is Juliet Davenport, founder and CEO of Good Energy. Uh, Welcome, Juliet. Thank you, John, and thank you for the intro. <laughs> uh, Juliet, briefly, before we get into it, can you say a little bit about what Good Energy does? What, what's, your, what's your role? Okay. Well, I mean, what's really interesting about what Good Energy does is that uh, over the last two, two decades, it's changed. So when we originally came into this marketplace, uh, renewables was about between 2 and 4%. We came in with a 100% renewable offering, um, we were hugely criticized for it, interestingly, because Mm -hmm. what we set out to say was that we believed that 100% was possible. We wanted to trade 100% renewable, so that meant buying the power directly and then selling that to consumers and actually working out all the hiccups. Because one of the things, uh, previous to this, I worked in policy and academia. And when you look at a policy or when you look from an academic point of view, quite often it's really difficult to see the small things that get in the way of delivering a new technology or a new system. And, and that was really the ambition of Good Energy, first of all, was to be a trailblazer, consumer-led trailblazer, that tried to figure out what were the barriers to getting more renewables into the system um, and how could we change those. And, and, and that's what we've done all the way along. So the next barrier we removed, we worked, worked very closely with customers who wanted to generate their own power. So, so we really became, um, started working with small generators in 2004 to get exports from people's homes. That was a precursor to feed in tariff. So if you try and describe our business, actually our business looks like um, we believe that the future energy businesses are going to be more about not taking power from big power stations and transmitting them through power lines, but more about how helping consumers balance their power and then providing services to them to help them do that and get income from to them. And so we're really a green energy service supplier in a way. So we supply green electricity, we supply green gas, um, but we also plug customers in to the wider marketplace and, and really bring value to them for any of their green technologies they want to invest in. Excellent. Um, thanks for the summary. There's a couple of things that I'd really like to dig into a little bit later. The you know what is 100% green power question, yeah. and and the the role of distributed energy compared to transmission connected energy. But before I do one thing, I, one thing you've done recently, you have a thing. You know, you've got a majority stake in a thing called Zap Map, as I understand yeah. it. I'm I'm not an EV driver, but I but John. I know of EV drivers. <laughs> What does, what does ZapMap do and how does that fit, fit in with your, with your strategy? So if you, if, uh, we, if you take a step back, so we, we believe that uh, electric transport is one of the key ways of decarbonizing energy in the UK. And so if you, if you take a step back, what are the barriers to, for EV drivers to feel comfortable about switching off their gas, their petrol and diesel cars and switching to EV? So the first one is range anxiety. And if you deep d- delve into range anxiety, there's a couple of things in there you can deal with. One, you can deal with battery size, which is fine. And mm. there's research. You've got the Faraday Institute and you've got Tesla and you've got a load of Im- investment going into the technological side of that. Mm. The other piece is what does the infrastructure look like and how can I access that infrastructure to charge my vehicle when I'm on the move? So whether that's where I've ended up 
at work or at a meeting or at a hotel for a weekend destination, wherever I want to go, how can I make sure that I feel comfortable getting there um, with the range of my vehicle and charging along the way? And what ZapMap does is it has data on I think 90% of the charging points across the use. It has live data on 90%. Mm -hmm. You're going out, is this on a register or are you going out and inspecting or how, how does it work? No, no, so it's working with the, the charging um, in organizations, like the companies, yeah, the companies themselves. And then it displays that to consumers and puts that through a mapping process so that uh, I st sit here, I can either access it on my screen like a normal Google Maps, um, I go onto ZapMap, I say where I want to go, and it will map me a journey that will take me there and back and tell mm -hmm. me where I can charge and what, what type of charges they are, how long they charge. Um, there's also in the chat function on the app that you can see there's a lot of consumer feedback. So it tells you whether oh. people think it's not very good or like there's the nowhere reliability to have a of the charger, of a particular charger or something like uh, that. Yeah, but also, because um, the average stop, I think, at a service station before you start doing electric vehicles is probably about 17 to 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, you need to charge, on average, probably a, a sort of charging point, maybe 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, so, okay. So, so generally, you want to go to the nicer service station. Is the bacon, is the bacon sandwich nice? Exactly. Or is there, a, that sort of, is there a children's playground, that type yeah. of thing? So, okay. so, so it becomes, it becomes uh, sort of more of a lifestyle approach. And um, so that's what ZapMap does, is it helps with that range anxiety. And, and actually, I don't know whether you ever watch television. I, I don't watch it that often, but I've just seen the new Renault ads where they're advertising the in-car mapping service as part of the range anxiety as part of a selling point. They're obviously seeing, again, that as a key selling point for the vehicle. And, and that's what ZapMap does. ZapMap tries to play a role of removing anxiety in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Do you think range anxiety is declining as a, as a concern for, for people over time? You know, this has been around for a while. Obviously, the technology is moving forward. Batteries are getting cheaper. Do you think yeah. it's subsiding? And, and, and if it is, what do you think is driving that? Reduction so I, in range. So, so I think if you look, what's what was interesting during the COVID period is that um, we definitely saw um, the percentage of new vehicles purchased that were EV or or hybrid significantly jumped during that period. Now that may have been because they were already ordered, or that people um, who were interested in new vehicles, um, if interested in EVs, were still going to buy independent of the economic downturn. So, may, so, but I think really what we're looking at here is one batch of the cars themselves are getting better so you've mm. got a more a higher range of cars so you've got ev options in every single type of car so whether it's a small mini a medium mini a kind of a saloon a four by four so you've got op there's now options everywhere because previously there were very few options in every single sector of where somebody might be buying a car so that's number one number two the range is better um, so the car itself is performing better. And number three, we now have more charging points and petrol stations yeah. in the UK. And I think you need all of those to start to see this market transform and people start to pick up. And, and also there's a confidence thing. There's, if you, one of the things about the whole point about this conversation about the green number plate is that when you see more electric vehicles, you mm. get more confident about buying one yourself. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that was, I was going to ask you, because you, you came at it from a very fact-based, batteries are better, chargers are better, but it seems like there's this element of just, oh, my neighbor has an EV and they seem to be you know, on time to places, so maybe I could do that as, as well. Completely. But, I, think, just, I think it needs all of those. And just to digress, one more digression on this on this Zap Map EV thing. So I think you're a Tesla driver. Um, is yes. why is why? And you talked about different ranges of cars. Why is Tesla so successful? And in a sense, why do the public markets think Tesla is going to have this sort of dominant position compared to other other makes and models that are that are coming along as well? Do you, do you have a theory on that? I have many theories on that. And, <laughs> and I, um, so I, I'll share a little interlude of when I so I went to, I think it was uh, last year, I went to uh, an international conference on EV charge, EVs, um, electric vehicles, generally, whether it's trains, cars, etc, in Paris. And um, 
I was sitting next to one of the chief engineers of one of the very large manufacturers, quite germane in character. And um, I challenged him on how had they let... So first of all, I challenged him on how do you do your innovation? How do you do your change? How do you do your technological change? Mm. And he turned around to me and said, yes, we do it all in-house. <laughs> and it's like, okay, excellent. So you don't really look at the market out there. Um, big companies well known for innovation and change. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what was interesting is many years ago, as I, when I grew up, I was, um, I, my father was part of the most sport industry and I spent a lot of time at race circuits. And actually race circuits was where a lot of the innovation in the motorsport sector came through into mm -hmm. the main motoring industry. But this is obviously a massive shift out of that paradigm. And it needed a Tesla to come in. And there was such a large space because these guys were kind of in their own world. They didn't believe in anything else. They didn't yeah. believe that electric vehicles were challenging them. And they just left this massive fat space for somebody in to come and challenge. And they, they did. were squeezing out percent of efficiency on an ICE without thinking about Completely. what you know, one else was Completely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, I recently wrote something about innovation and I think innovation, my personal view of innovation is it should be big steps. It should be mm. leaps. Um, mm. And it's great to see innovation where you, you might produce a couple of more baked bean cans out of a factory. But, but for me, that's not innovation. That's just constant improvement of efficiency. Yeah. Um, yeah. Innovation, true innovation is where you see these leaps. And, and, and quite often, I think those have to come from challenge from mice outside. Some of, some of the mad ideas that lots of people dismiss mm. actually are where some of the true talent comes. And that's what, that's what Tesla's had. Whether Tesla yeah. will maintain that is another thing. Whether it can keep, whether, it, whether, whether um, Musk can keep that advantage that he's had so far, it'll yeah. be interesting to see. Well, you're, I mean, in a sense, you're very well placed to have a view on that, right? I mean, you, this is a brand question in a sense. This is, mm -hmm. you know, I, iPhones have created a true trillion dollar company. Uh, and, and from my perspective, despite sort of others having similar capabilities now yeah. at, at lower cost, do you think it's sustainable? I think it really depends on whether the company is well run and the technology mm. continues to deliver. So yeah. I think there were a lot of the early Teslas that had teething issues. There was a windscreen issue, whether the windscreen would go yellow or some of the basics that actually car, car manufacturers do very well. I yeah. think Tesla probably didn't do as well. Um, and it reminded me of some of the early, early, uh, do you remember, Brit you probably don't remember British Leyland or Austin Rover, who, yeah, remember, who had yeah. some pretty cool cars, but uh, they used to slightly fall apart. Yeah. And I think as long as Tesla can avoid the, the kind of make sure they get the basics right, they can probably stay ahead. But if, yeah. they, if they start to fall down on the basics, like the wheels don't work or the door doesn't close or yeah. little yeah, things that everybody expects as a straightforward piece, then, then they'll struggle. But, it, but if, they can, if they can maintain the quality and push forward the innovation, then, then they should be fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I asked you a fairly innocuous question about ZapMap and we, we digress, <laughs> very, very interesting digression into the electric vehicle market. Can I bring it back? And what I'd like to do before we get into those points about you know, green energy and the role of distributed energy, just understand a little bit about your journey. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I find interesting is you studied physics at university. Yeah. Um, so you were kind of hardcore, hardcore science, as it appears to me. Why? Yeah. Why did you study physics? And do you think it, like, do you think it prepared you well for what you've done now? Okay. So, so, so what you have to remember, John, is that I didn't think of any preparation whatsoever about what I wanted to do before I studied physics. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid. So there wasn't any great plan at all. Um, there was a very simple plan in that when I chose my A-levels, um, and I, I had a natural capability in maths and physics um, given, uh, I did look at all the sciences. I looked at the number of folders that you had um, to study those sciences, and I chose the ones with the least number. Okay. So if you did okay. biology, you had to have five folders. So that probably goes back to, I probably... <laughs> Um, I rely more on understanding than I rely yeah. on memory. So yeah. if, you, if you ask me a bunch of historical facts, I will not remember them. If you want, if you want to ask me about a strategy of a particular um, sort of political party, then I'm probably better at remembering something like that than I am the dates. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's and, a, from a shorthand for your comparative like. advantage, the number of folders in, in a sense. <laughs> 
Oh. Yeah, so, so I mean, okay. uh, for me, physics is very much about a, a deep understanding of the ability to think at various different levels, even if you don't understand every single part of how something's built up, like quantum yeah. physics or special relativity. You can use some of those theories to then create something else. And, and I guess that's what appealed to me is that actually there's a bunch of stuff in physics that isn't known, um, that, that is completely unknown. And um, there, was a, there, was, there was space to be exploratory in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that's mirrored in, in what you're doing at the moment, in a sense. I guess so. I mean, I, yeah. think, I think for me, um, I, I, I talked to various different people and it, it, my, my vision has always been, I don't believe it's not possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that goes back to very first starting good energy. I mean, the number of people I got to- told me that you can't, you can't do 100%. The UK couldn't ever be 100% renewable. I just mm-hmm. disagreed with them. And there may still be elements that, that we can't deliver with 100%. But hey, wind del- delivered 59% of power sort of last weekend. Um, if you said that to somebody, even 10 years ago, I think most people would have completely disbelieved you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in a sense, I suppose the, the energy transition is, I, uh, the way I see it at least, is it's a sort of multi-decade blank canvas uh, yeah. where there's a lot of innovation and creativity to be done and, and, and people who are pushing things forward can, uh, can achieve quite a lot over, over a very long period of time. It feels like. Completely, completely. And I think, I think our, our, our sort of, I've seen my role, particularly at Good, but also sort of just independent, sort of all the work I've done in different organisations. So I, I'm on the Council of Innovate UK, Board of REA, and just about to join the Crown Estate. I kind of think it's all about asking the big questions and mm. not just being stuck in the now. It has to be stuck in the future. Yeah. Just one other thing on your past. You thought about being a radio host at one point. <laughs> why, why, didn't, why, why didn't you go down that route? Oh, uh, so this is a, so, so, John, you're going back in my murky history. So um, I did, I, bought, I kind of, I, this was a point before, way before I started Good, when I didn't quite know what I wanted to be. And, um, <laughs> And it being sort of volunteering for local hospital radio was a potential route into radio. It was, it was a classic route for broadcasters. And so I did. I managed to get a slot. It was very competitive, actually. I have to say, okay. I remember standing up. You had to pitch in front of all your competitors. I think there were about 30 in the room to why they should take you. Anyway, I, yeah. it was ruthless because you had to kind of diss everybody Disparage. else yeah, yeah, exactly. in front of them. Stuffily, anyway, though, presumably. Especially in the UK, you wouldn't, you wouldn't yeah, want to offend no, anyone out of their fate. Exactly. So, um, uh, and I was, I was successful there. And, and um, I re- had a really brilliant time, actually. And it really taught you how to not say um too many times. So mm-hmm. it did a lot of prep for me. Um, but I just said um then. Uh, what was interesting, though, I, I had this session where I was still training at this point And... I, I just don't think I'm a good enough music person. So I have my own taste in music, but thinking about what somebody else might think about my taste, I hadn't really gone through my head. And so I always loved, I don't remember whether you remember MASH, the series on yeah, TV. Yeah, yeah. And I always loved the signature tune of that. Um, but I hadn't really thought about the words. And so I put this song on, because it was a fairly limited, there was a lot of Engelbert Humperdinck because um, mm. basically it was all donations that had been given to the hospital and I pulled this off it was a mass signature tune put it on and it said suicide is painless blasting out across the hospital and I just thought yeah I'm not sure this job is for me really okay yes <laughs> it wouldn't have gone down very well um so yes yeah, so I decided at I that point not, yeah. I probably uh, uh, yeah but it wasn't for me but it, but I really enjoyed my time doing it and it, it taught me a huge amount and if anybody is ever interested to be a broadcaster it's, it's a really good way to get in yeah okay interesting now can we talk about good energy so the fir- first question I, I have on this and it mm-hmm. follows on I was talking to Jonathan Brearley the Ofgem CEO recently for the podcast uh, and he was talking about supply markets i asked him what's the impact of covid been how's that how's that looking and he said so far so good but we're keeping a a watching brief on it how do you see the impact of covid on on supply and i mean i don't just mean the financials although i'm interested in you know how do you think people are faring yeah uh, but also sort of the business model is it is it changing you know how it needs to work yeah i mean i think so 
if you look at the, the, the immediate impact was that everybody went home. So yeah. uh, suddenly you did see an increase in domestic demand um, and a decrease in business demand. But overall, I mean, if you looked at the stats, I think the, oh, you probably know better than I do, John. I think it was about a 13% drop in total yeah, demand. Yeah, sounds about UK. right. Yeah. And, and we, so we saw that as a balance between sort of larger businesses. Businesses were dropping like 30 to 40% in terms of total demand. Domestic was going up between sort of 10 and 15%. So you can kind of see why, why you saw that um, asymmetry. Um, we'll kind of see that shift, but obviously it's going to come down to the economic outcome of COVID. And the, so, so you had the immediate piece of that, the immediate drop in wholesale prices. So any power that you had extra that you brought forward um, for fixed term contracts, you had to sell in a falling market. So that had an immediate mark to market impact, I think, on most suppliers. Um, we also had a warm winter, so we had less gas, gas supply generally um, in the UK. So I think British Gas has already come out and said that's, that's impacted them. Uh, so so you, your revenues are down. You, you've had some immediate impacts. The CFD was a big impact because obviously uh, we've all got a massive bill from the CFD having paid the difference between yeah. the, the market price and CFD price. So that that's come yeah. through as an unexpected addition as well. So you, you'll pass that on to consumers though, presumably. Not always. Or, depends yeah, okay. depends where it is. Yeah. So domestic consumers, that's quite hard to pass on to. Interesting. Uh, yeah. so so you've got you've got a bunch of additional potential costs that sort of being the short term piece. But the next piece is going to be what does the debt look like? Um, and we're already looking at the calculation based on economic, the economic downturn. And, and it, it could be, well, it depends, it depends on how good people are at collecting their debt or how good they've mm-hmm. been and, and how, what markets they've sold into. So if you've, gone, if you've gone in at really low margins, the question is, are those companies going to be able to collect those debts? Mm. Um, and, and what overhead is that going to take to do it? And that could be a much longer burn. We could see that yeah. take longer to come through and actually see, because obviously, although it does affect cash, it, it, you, can, you can survive for a while on that. But, mm. it, but if we start to see data coming through that shows that domestic households have increased, if people stay at home over this winter, then they're going to use more. So remember, we've been going through a summer period, so gas has been relatively low demand. But if we start to see that tick up again, you're going to build up more household debt. So I think, um, I think it's going to be interesting. I think yeah, it's, okay. I think We're not out of the woods. Months, no, no way. And it's, yeah, okay. Does it work just out of interest? So when, when, a, when, a, when a supply company goes bust, mm-hmm. they tend to socialize the costs of yeah, that mutualization mutualization if yeah. you, if if a consumer defaults on a on a solvent company if you're one of your customers that defaults does that get socialized as well or is that your no, problem that's okay. my problem <laughs> okay okay uh interesting uh, and it's, uh, people often from other markets say to me that's very odd that you know you would socialize the cost of a company going bust in in, in general in, in that, the UK. i mean I if, if you talk if you talk to um the previous head of Ofgem, um his view was that's the cost of competition and we're yeah. happy to pay that cost of competition. Um, obviously they didn't pay it. We did. Yeah. Um, we're happy to pay that comp- cost of competition because it, it improves the value to the domestic customer. But obviously we now all have to look at, do we build in risk profiles to our customer base to yeah. take into account that other companies are going to go bust. And that's a really difficult thing to price into your model. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you can get some undesirable, kind of social outcomes in terms of who, who you supply power to, I suppose, yeah. and at what cost as well. C- can I ask, so, so one of the big themes you talked about when you explained good energy was being one of the early, early providers of 100% renewable power. Yeah. Th- this is a topic that kind of exercises people. You know, I'm on a local email list for my local community. And, you know, there are very few topics that cause debate on that list. It's normally people selling, selling things or dropping off sugar at people's houses. One of, one of them is the, the local teenagers. The other one is um, what they're doing down at the park. The other one is green energy. And what is green <laughs> energy? Can you explain how, how should one... Th- so this is a debatable topic. It's not like it's very easy to say it's 100% green or it's not. How do you explain to people why good energy's power is 100% renewable compared to, say, say others? Or what are the shades of grey here? So, so I think there is actually a really 
simple way of thinking about this. And, and, and this work was done by Ofgem sort of pre-2013, where there is a license condition which basically talks about what you can claim as renewable energy and what, how, what environmental claims you can make. And I think this is an area where we, we think there needs to be some stepping up of interpretation and understanding because I think consumers find it very complicated. So the first part of it says that you can call your power renewable if it has a rego and it has something called a LEC. Now, John, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you remember what a LEC is, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Now, the reason yeah. why the LEC was important was because... A LEC it, is a set, just for everyone listening, a LEC is essentially a, a, a like a, 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 in a sense, a tradable permit, I suppose, that says this is green power on the GB power grid. Yeah, it, it had a slightly, it was slightly more specific than that. So it was, it was created as part of the climate change levy. And it was an exemption capability that you could exempt business customers from paying the climate change levy. Mm -hmm. The really interesting thing about it under the legislation was that it had to be power supplied into the UK. It had to be linked to power supplied into the UK and it was stapled to the power. So you couldn't separate a lack. You couldn't trade it separately from trading the green power. Mm -hmm. And that was quite important because essentially what it allowed, it made sure is that you didn't get double counting. Um, it was it was within the UK, so you knew it came, where it came from, um, and it meant that it, the customer could be confident that when it was called renewable power, it was renewable power. Yeah, now, and I suppose there's this. Maybe you're about to go somewhere on this, but there's there's always this additionality question: you know, would that asset? I'll come to that. I'll come okay, to the second good. part. Okay, I'll come wonderful. to the second part. Okay. So, so there were two parts of this license condition. The LEC was part of the first part, which said that you could call it renewable power. Now, the levy exemption certificate was removed in 2015, and I have to say, I kick myself because I should have remembered that there was this part in the license, but it was quite small, and I'd slightly forgotten it because the implication was that now the levy exemption certificate didn't exist. You could just use the Rego. Now the challenge with the Rego is the Rego is completely separable. So if I am a renewable generator, I could sell you business customer in, in, on my doorstep through a private wire, renewable electricity. Now I'm not a licensed supplier. I have no regs over me. I can just supply that power directly to you. And you would say, I'm buying the power from the wind farm. I'm green and make any claims you want to. Yeah. But I could also sell the Regos to a supplier who would then attach that to its existing brown power and then under its license would be able to call itself green. So you've got the challenge that you've got direct supplies now coming from sleeve PPAs directly into businesses. Um, and you've got the Regos that are completely tradable across, uh, across borders, but also separated from the power. So we've got a big challenge in that unless you staple the regos to the power and that's why from our point of view we we do an audit on our power purchase agreements with all our renewable generators and our regos stay with it and we have more regos at the end of the year we don't sell them on we hold them so so an economist might say well don't we want these things trade you know economists like trading things because they say well yeah, they hang on maybe we don't want the wind farm next to the the private wires next to the business maybe we want the wind farm in scotland um and if the business in cornwall's prepared to pay the wind farm in Scotland, that's great because we're getting the power where it's cheapest and we're using it where it's needed. But you can still um, do that. You can still pin the PPA to it. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is the, the economist, where the economist breaks down is the fact that you're double counting the power. So all we're saying is you've got to close the loophole. Doesn't mean you can't trade it. Doesn't mean you can't trade the PPA with the Rego, but just close the loophole. And that is what yeah. the levy exemption stapling did. It closed that loophole. Because the other issue you've got is that this is the same across Europe. So Regos and Goos are tradable across Europe. Yeah. Um, there is also a very strange additional piece is that if you buy Regos, the equivalent of Regos in Europe, which is something called Goos, um, you can also get exemptions from paying anything towards the um, CFDs. Um, set pay, I think it's the CFDs or is it a feed-in tariff? It's one of those instruments that you get an exemption from as a result of buying goose. So, so not only are you buying a certificate from something that might already have been double sold, but mm. also you're getting out of paying some of the renewable fees in the UK, which means yeah. that you're probably less green than even, <laughs> even if you yeah. just had the Regos. So uh, it, uh, our challenge is that 
this is this is a big area we need to build up consumer um protection around this yeah. and we need to build consumer confidence because obviously you've got the debate going on um and this is something we think Ofgem should take a lead on and should investigate the, the work has already been done it just needs to be refreshed and then held to account because the second part of the license condition is that you can't make any green claims unless you can prove additionality mm -hmm. okay. and and we think that is 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 widely being sort of um ignored and additionality is for, for everyone listening is in essence proving that but for the you know contracting this power it, it wouldn't exist in in a sense probably. partially yeah i mean it basically yeah. that you were doing something above and beyond to make this marketplace move forward in one way or another that's green and and you have to be quite specific about what your additionality was and if you go back to about 2013 there was an accreditation scheme run by ofgem um, where suppliers had to provide evidence on additionality on regos and lacks so that consumer was actually protected at that point but it, it, it kind of all went by the wayside um uh, it's sort of when levy exemption certificates were removed and then we had um, retail market review so everybody went down to four tariffs and people didn't were interested in green tariffs so so there's been a bunch of things that have happened that have kind of slightly undermined this point but yeah we okay. think it's time with with at least 50% of sales last year, um, uh, we understand on tariffs, at least in the domestic market, came from renewable energy. Now, mm -hmm. that was in the year when I think renewable energy was about 37% of the market. Now, maybe okay. there were very few they sales in the business sector. Yeah. Maybe it was coming from other countries, but there's no, there's no European-wide scheme to prevent the double selling in country and out of country. Yeah, interesting. Do, do you think we, do, like, fast forward 10 years, do you think it is black and white? It's either green or not? Or, I mean, it feels to me, given the complexity and given people's preferences, you know, is it additional? Is it, you know, I think is it's it really Dutch? Easy. Is it Norwegian? You, you, there's going to be shades of grey in this space. Of course, but, it, but, it, but I think it's really easy. I think you have, just have to be transparent. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. having a form of accreditation where somebody else does the hard work and yeah. checks that your claims are correct. Because I yeah. don't think at the moment, quite often the ASA is, is cited as being the people you should go and check this with, but that doesn't give consumers any recourse. So if they feel that they've been missold a product, they can't get any money back by taking a company to the ASA. Yeah. All they can do is stop the advertising. So, yeah. so I, I really do think that consumers need to be protected. They need recourse if they feel that they've been missold something. Um, and they, they need to have confidence in a scheme that is complicated, but somebody else has checked it out for them so they can have confidence in it. Yeah. And that, that's, that's what we're, we, we think that that's, it's, a lot of the work's already been done, as I said. It's all there historically. Um, there's a couple of academics, it's one at Imperial and one, one somewhere else who, who can do this work and it wouldn't take very long to do. And we think it would protect us from yeah. getting into a mass mis-selling kind of hysteria sort of crisis where yeah. it starts to hit the national headlines and then nobody trusts anything. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, certainly my local, local um, parents email list suggests there's confusion to be, to be clarified on this, on this yeah. topic. It's more yeah, well, they could all rise to the ombudsman maybe. Yeah. That's what they should do. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to wade into that, uh, that argument. I'll just, I'll just watch. The, the, so do you just as a related point, right? So you called good energy. That's yeah. a sort of, do you know, it's a sort of, it's a bullish statement, right? Good, you know, good. Do you ever have the issue? It's not great. You've, you know, you're not, you've sort of, well, not, not that far out there. Do you ever, ever have a problem where you set the bar too high for yourselves in a sense? Or maybe that's yeah. part of the business model where yeah, I'm sure there are some people who will never be satisfied and use good energy as a way to kind of whack you on the head, you know, when you, when you, when you, when things don't quite go perfectly. But do you, yeah, do, do you find that sometimes means you set the bar too high from a, from a kind of marketing perspective? I think we're quite, we're quite conscious of not trying to be whiter than white. Yeah. Um, I think, I think what we're, what, 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 what we've kind of done over the years and I, and this, whether this was by design or, or just by mistake is, is I think created a company that now has, um, sort of really moved into its maturity and we're beginning to see other alignments now. So if you, I, I'm sure you're aware of the future corporation work that's being done by the British Academy, um, where that's looking at kind of 
what what do corporations include in their um Indeed. in their in their statutory um requirements and their governance yeah. um how do they look after their staff how do they look after their consumers how do they look after their shareholders and how do they look after the future as well so that color whole thing of future looking we have a responsibility to the next generation um and we've kind of built that into good energy and part of that is about experimenting trying mm. different things trying to get things to work so I think the answer is that we've never tried to, I, I try, I try and make sure my guys um, try not to be white and white because everybody's fallible. Um, mm. You don't always get things right, but try and do what we can when we can. Yeah. Um, and really uh, sort of, uh, I guess, take an ethical stance, but it's, it's not at the detriment of, of trying to change things um, yeah. and, and getting sidelined. It is going, you know what? We, we, we think there's a, there's there's an out and out solution on this but we we want to move towards it we may not do it all today yeah does some does so the flip side of that i suppose is and and as i see it i think it's on your website you're you know you're building a a company that can deliver the needs of society in a purposeful way Mm -hmm. rather than just thinking about money Mm -hmm. now does that the, the the fact that you're not just thinking about money? Does that and you're a publicly listed company? Does that cause problems? I mean, you know, is, 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 you know, people who invest in stocks, you know, often often are thinking, well, you know, the management's here to protect my to protect my rights yeah. and, and and generate a, a return. How do you how does that work at the AGM and 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 when you when you engage with shareholders? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes back down to this kind of idea of social and ethical investment which i think we're now seeing that a lot of the pension funds a lot of the the stock exchange so we we're part of the green mark at the london stock exchange so we're one of the first companies to get that green mark which sort of stands us out as a as as an organization that looks does think about more widely than just the short-term returns um Mm. and and what I think we're seeing is money is recognizing that short-term returns doesn't necessarily give you long-term gain. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also means that you quite often make bad decisions in the short term uh, when you're just chasing return immediately. Now I would say that if I look at most of my competitors, um, most of them don't make any money. So I'm probably doing a better job that yeah. than they yeah. are. Um, it's quite so, fashionable at the moment. Well, not, well, make not to make in, any money. Yeah, yeah, uh, and GB supply at the moment. <laughs> so, so, so there is there is a question out there on that. But I, I think the answer to that is that this is the trend that I think where, where we started working towards many years ago is a trend that we're already seeing that investors are now asking that they want to see um, the environmental reporting, they want to see the impacts, they want to see the risk register related to climate change, the environment, um, diversity. And, and we're seeing all these things begin to play through in investment criteria. Mm. And I think that's what's really important is that um, we are a commercial business. Uh, we, we, we've always been a commercial business. And my view is the more, the more money we can make, the more money we can put back into our purpose and what we're trying to do. Um, yeah. and that our shareholders will be happy um, and they need to move us forward. So, so to be honest, John, I mean, I've, we've, we've always been pretty cool at our AGMs in terms of that kind of questioning. It, we, we very rarely have been questioned on diversity and championing diversity. I was a kind of founding member of Powerful Women. Um, we've never really uh, had pushback about any of the local community work we've done with our renewable generators um, the funds and the work we do locally, that's never been a pushback yeah, okay. and that's been embraced. So I, I actually think that it stood us in really good stead. And I think good businesses don't just look to short-term return. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be the way the world's going, all the ESG stuff. And, and, you know, even I think when BP came out with their, with their hugely ambitious strategy recently, yeah. You know, part of it was about, you know, a big part of it from the CEO, Bernard Looney, was about attracting talent. And it was just they yeah. couldn't compete for talent anymore no. because their mission and, uh, you know, their, their, their mission and, and, and the way they were going wasn't consistent with, um, with hiring the best. Yeah. And, and that, that's when it becomes pretty serious. Yeah. Um, can I ask, you talked about loss making. It's, can I ask you about the importance of scale? So your, your strategy in the, 
in the UK supply industry seems to have been, yeah, we want to be profitable. Um, we, and, 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 I, and I think, and again, I'm not particularly close to this, you haven't sort of pushed for scale and tried to sign on millions of customers that are leaving some of the more, you know, the big six and the old established companies. Mm-hmm. You're just sort of sol- solidly building a business. Whereas I suppose that, you know, as, as I think you alluded to, you know, some of the prominent examples, Octopus is a, is a unicorn, their supply business now, because they've just taken on an enormous scale. I don't, I don't think they're m- making huge, huge amounts of profit. Um, why did you go that route? Um, I suppose, and do you have any regrets about it, seeing some of the other, some of the other stories out there, you know, in the valuations you're seeing there? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if I was only interested in sort of, sort of trying to flog a company and flog things, then yeah, maybe that would have been a different route. Um, I mean, I think what's interesting is that we've sort of, we've had pretty significant growth in our business sector part. What we, made, what we made a conscious decision is that we didn't want to be the bottom feeders. So we didn't want to be at the bottom of the market trying to pick up customers at negative mm-hmm. margins. The premium product with a, yeah. pre, with a somewhat um, premium price, a reasonable price. Yeah, because be, mainly because of the risk on the, and, and also probably because of the makeup of our shareholder base. I mean, we, we came into this market when there weren't that many people interested in investing in renewable energy and let let alone renewable energy suppliers and um we we actually crowdfunded the business right at the beginning which meant we've got about 60 percent of the customer the, the the company is owned by our customers um yeah. which which does it brings different challenges i mean we we actually raised some short-term bond financing um which was very effective for the business um, so I think I think in terms of scale, probably where we've scaled more um, is in small generation. So we look after about twenty one percent of the feed and tariff market. So we have we have some sort of reasonable, and that that kind of is far closer to our business model, where um, empowering individuals to generate power in their own home and empowering businesses to do the same is part of our future strategy. Is where we think we'll see the decentralized market go. So we may not have gone for that big kicker in growth. I mean, partially because we had to deal with the early years um, and the trans- early transformation of the market. But secondly, uh, do, I, do I wish we had millions more customers? Um, I, I think it would, be, it would be good to have a good customer base. What I wouldn't want to see is some of the churn rates that are kind of are indicative of this market, close to 50% on some where basically you may be getting a huge number of customers, but then you're having to try and hang on to them. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, that's not as much of our issue. Um, we've got some levels of churn, but they're, they're nothing like some of the, the really high levels we've seen coming out of the market. Interesting. C- could I just on the, you said you've got 20% of the, the, the fit um, generate, you know, there's people with solar on their roofs yeah. or, or some, something like that. And then they're, they're your customers and you've got tariffs, which enable them to, to optimize those things. And you've talked about it a few times, the consumer led approach. So, yeah. so, so I, I, and I focus a lot more on the, on the, on the sort of large scale and the transmission stuff, but to me, it feels like um, there's a, some of the impediments here are, you know, I, I know what the CapEx on a solar farm is that when it's big compared to when it's small and it's a lot cheaper, I know the transmission network's actually pretty cheap in terms of grids. You know, it's a distribution network that's that's the big part of people's bills. The transmission's maybe a couple of percent of a of a bill. So it yeah. seems like there's some reasonably strong scale economies in doing things big, even if it's renewables. And then they, again, I, I I don't know about the economics of generating on your home. What is it that's going to drive if there is a cost disadvantage? If I'm right and there is a cost disadvantage here, what is driving the distributed and consumer led sort of industry forward? I think it's partially because if you look for an individual where they could so so if you if you're a large investor, your sort of your demand in terms of what return you might get or a VC type investor, they're pretty high. If you mm-hmm. if you if you're a if you're a sort of average householder and you go to your bank and you put your money in your bank, what return are you getting today? Yeah. Okay. So so to be honest, they're better off putting their money on their roof and getting a better return virtually immediately. And yeah. I think that's potentially where we could see this being driven is that um, there is for for individuals and, and small businesses, there's very few places that they can put cash that gives them a, a decent level of return. Yeah. Um, and this is one of them. And this yeah. is, it kind of it slightly future proofs them 
um, in terms of future inflation as well. Um, yeah. It gives them some autonomy. And there is, there is, I think there is a general feeling that people want to own their own power. They want mm -hmm. to own their own house, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think there is that that's what it's being driven about. That obviously that sort of reduces the market because that will be homeowners um, and that side. I think the other side we're seeing is particularly with new developments or social housing developments where sort of the installation of solar can be seen as a tool to support um, reducing bills for, for people who struggle as well. So I think we're seeing both at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is a really interesting model. I mean, one, one of the breakdowns of economics. So um, you, I don't know whether you know, I did a master's in economics after I did my physics. Um, and I think one of the breakdowns of economics is it's a really good tool to look at things. But sometimes um, it doesn't always describe market behavior particularly well, particularly consumer behavior, I think is, is um, the, the, the concept of increasing utility doesn't always work particularly well. So you, you have to look at other factors and you also have to consider what size your market is and what market you're dealing in. Um, and then yeah. you get a much better response to understanding why householders might look at solo, even though it'd be much more cost effective to put it in a large field. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point and it's come up quite a bit in this podcast series. So, so again, speaking to Jonathan really recently, we talk, you know, he talked about but you know, before he was designing the, or when he was designing the electricity market reforms in this country was, look, we just had to get security of supply off the table as an issue, because yeah. if the lights are going out or if the newspapers are writing about the lights going out every, every year in, in February, then, then we can't do any other policy. And, you know, an economist might say, well, you know, capacity market is a bit of a distortion or it's not quite efficient. And, and, and it was sort of that real world nuance, I think, were vital to making progress. Yeah. The, the, I suppose there's a risk, isn't there, which is, is you know, and I'm an economist and, and you know, it's easy to, easy to bag economic theory. But as soon as you throw it away, you're kind of floating and it's kind of anything's possible. You could justify anything on the basis yeah. of, of yeah. behavior. So there's a, it feels like there's a tension. A lot of that policy action is, okay, you know, why doesn't economics work? And, and then what's a, what, what's a way to fix it? But the premise of economics works is not a bad starting point, it feels no, like to me. No, no, I agree. And, and, and this, is, this, is, this is about understanding. So one of the best, best tutorials I ever went to um, was in my last term when we, on economic, uh, economics theory, um, econometric theory. And um, one of it, it was basically saying, uh, it, was, it was all about the golden, I can't remember, the golden prize in the city for who forecasts mm -hmm. what the econo economy is going to do the next year and who got it closest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and basically, our tutor explained to us how you explain why your economic doesn't, model doesn't work. And for me, the value of economic model is the journey that you go through yeah. to put the data in and understand the dynamics of it. It's the same as a yeah. business model. A business model forecast is never going to be right. Mm. But the point is that by using something like that, you understand where your variables are and you understand um, what's going to be tipping it one way or another. But what you can't do is believe the outcome completely because yeah. it doesn't work like that. And every, anybody who's ever run a business knows that the business plan they started with is not what they end up with. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with the economic theory is that I think government has to be policy obviously has to be embedded and, and economics should drive that policy economic th sort of foundations should drive it. But you, 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 at your, you believe in economics completely at your detriment because if yeah. you do and don't take into account, for example, security supply um, because politicians get, unelected for that and hmm. they have the tools of changing the frameworks yeah. then that's part of your economic system really yeah yeah and i'd add i think models are very good at making you explicitly state your assumptions yeah uh, which is a, which is another useful yeah, no. useful useful thing John, about don't models. get me wrong i love economic <laughs> models economic <laughs> models and energy models are some of my favorite things but they are for discovery not for um not for What's the word? Uh, sort of Forecast. absolute truth. Yeah, a, tr a crystal ball. Yes, exactly. That's they are a, not that's crystal balls. Yeah. They are discovery yeah. tech mechanisms. Yeah, yeah. No, that's my that I, I have a session with new starters at Aurora. I do one every two or three months, and and I actually spend quite a lot of time on what our models good for and what aren't they. So it's a so it's a it's a favorite topic of mine. There's a lot more we could 
go into here, but we, <laughs> but we won't. So apologies if I come across as excessively defensive on this. <laughs> um, uh, it's something I feel strongly about, but it sounds as though we're fairly aligned on. Yeah, on, I think so. It's been long enough in power markets. You, um, you, you get a sense of these things. Okay. So, so before we conclude, what I'd like to do, and we covered a lot of ground, I'd like to just throw a few concepts at you um, and ask you whether you think they're underrated or overrated. And the best answer is one that's a one word answer. So, so you a, a strong commitment to either underrated or overrated. Obviously, if you, if you want to sit on the fence, then, then, then no, that's, that's also fine. Um, so the first concept is smart devices as a source of grid flexibility. And that could include EVs. Um, yeah. But uh, do you think they're overrated or underrated? Completely underrated. Okay, good. I thought you would say that. <laughs> um, next carbon taxes for driving decarbonization in the power sector completely uh, overrated over okay completely good this is good you these are some of the most definitive over and underrated we've had on the show okay i worked i worked on carbon taxes many years ago yeah yeah okay and i and i thought we might i thought i might get a strong response on those two okay so the third one the role of negative emissions technologies in achieving net zero uh uh don't know actually yet um okay. i think they they have in in those areas that are hard to reach an opportunity mm. yeah i always say you know it might be one of those ones where the tradable permit is useful you know if we don't think we can decarbonize aviation then uh, and we want to get to net zero we're probably going to need to do something here yeah. is, is, is my is my sense you may want, not want to stick them to, stick them together um, like, like with the Rigos. Um, okay, final concept. Um, the role of government support in getting emissions to net zero. Uh, overrated or underrated? Oh, it depends how you define the support. So the, the role of government defining the marketplaces, absolutely um, key and important. Yeah. The actual role of direct support, i.e. Like direct subsidy, yeah. um, overrated. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I should have, I'm glad you, I'm glad you split that out because they're two really important concepts yeah. here. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Julia, um, that's a really, I think, good time to conclude with th <laughs> Thanks so much for, for taking the time to speak with us. Um, and, uh, and, and, and thanks for going into a lot of detail around both good energy and also the sector. So, uh, Juliet Davenport, thanks so much for taking the time to speak. No problem, John. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. That was John Federson, Aurora's co-founder and chief executive, talking to Juliet Davenport, founder and CEO of Good Energy. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.